that time brought us together more than anything. I mean, Janai was a part of that quad. The, the things that we had to go through, the trainings that we had to endure, gave us so much self-confidence, right? Like, we could do anything. I mean, right, right. He, he even said, Racco, greatest coach in the world, that, that he experimented with us. Like, he couldn't believe that we could continue swimming for this amount of time. Hey, this is Sean Stringham with Game On Live Studio. We're all about helping grow the sport of water polo through understanding best practices from the perspective of athletes, parents, coaches, and the legends of water polo. If you're looking to get into water polo or want to see water polo grow as an athlete, supporter, or coach of the game, then you should subscribe. Click on the bell and get notified every time we release a new podcast. Game on. So we got we got all spectrums here. We got me and SoCal shirtless, Janai in Hawaii with a sweatshirt on. Is that a, a sweatshirt? Oh, a t-shirt. A t-shirt. And then I just <laughs> now I'm more comfortable talking. There we go. And John, I heard it just started snowing in Utah. Is that yeah, we got in the last storm cycle, we got 67 inches of snow up in the mountains. So they're getting hyped to get ready for ski season. So you got to come back out, Tony, and, and uh, we'll go skiing again this year. You remember when uh, you saved my son's life and picked him up? On <laughs> I do remember. I do remember. It's yeah. one of my yeah, I don't know this story. What happened? Favorite, favorite ski memories. We, uh, so Tony and Sarah and Cruz and I uh, all went up to Brighton to ski after one of the uh, one of the challenges that we ran here in Salt Lake with Tony, and we we decked him out in all the ski gear and uh, we we're cruising down and Cruz was doing fantastic and Cruz then was just cruising. he was cruising like but then just like as five year olds do just got like cold and stopped and like was done it's like okay so i just went into ski instructor mode and just picked him up and skied him down to the lodge and got him hot chocolate instantly and <laughs> saw, saved his life so people people don't realize you i like dude, we, i mean like i don't know if you ski but like i didn't definitely didn't grow up skiing and then i got to high school where like i could have skied but then i'm not going to risk my career to ski right so i just started like four years ago and i'm i'm trying i tried snowboarding once and i fell so many times that I've never been sore in my life that uh, I'm sticking to skiing. But like, dude, I'm just trying to like start this thing, you know? Tony, do you not know my first junior team, national team ex experience? <laughs> no. Because you're still younger. Canada, December 26th. <laughs> oh my God. Back when I had full dreads, I was the water pole version of Cool Runnings. <laughs> I, I, didn't have, I didn't have anything prepared for cold weather. I had, was wearing like I had shorts and I layered with the breakaway <laughs> USA water pole pants over it, right? I had, <laughs> didn't even have a turtleneck, right? I, so we get there, I, I'm freezing. And I, to, I didn't know I had to bring my own money for like miscellaneous stuff. I thought everything was paid for. So I was doing every dare bet, even on the plane. So I, so I think Adam Wright dared me to eat an entire can of Altoids. <laughs> right <laughs> so now i'm getting into negative what degree weather and i couldn't breathe like just even like waiting for the for the, the, the vans to come because my mouth is burning because it was raw and i'm breathing in freezing cold air <laughs> we'd get to the hotel and the first thing i just first time i'd ever stepped on ice boom like something out of a cartoon all six foot eight of me just back on my back so you're not a skier then not a skier <laughs> Mer Merrill and i ended up taking a train I don't even know where we went because it was before iPhones. I was like, oh, they said, yeah, go this way. We thought it was getting like a trolley, like in San Diego, I'm familiar with. We got on a train in Canada and went left Calgary and we're like on the way to Toronto or somewhere. Missed practice. <laughs> <laughs> no one knew where the goalies were because I was off trying to find a, a warm jacket. <laughs> Well, th there's a standing invitation out there for any of your friends or teammates, uh, Janai and Tony, to come to Salt Lake. I'll take you skiing. I'll get you the warm clothing. We'll have a great experience uh, up on the frozen water up there. We, we, it's, it's one of my passions. We're excited to ski as a family again this year. And so we'll, we'll get you up here. So right, let's, let's get back to water polo, what we're more familiar with. A little, okay, we'll, sounds we'll good. To you in your next podcast, the <laughs> water polo Tony one. So, so we're here with uh, Tony Acevedo, five-time Olympian, uh, participated in Rio, London, Beijing, where they won the silver medal, Athens and Sydney. 
Uh, Tony graduated from Stanford, for those of you who didn't know, where he dominated the men's water polo scene uh, as the Catino Award winner four years that he played there, scoring 332 goals. Tony played uh, in Italy, Croatia, Montenegro, and most conversations with Tony that I've ever been in end in some sort of fantastic story around those. So I'm sure we'll get into that as well. Um, and since retirement from the international water polo scene, has founded 6-8 Sports with Sarah Azevedo and now three-time Olympian Maggie Steffens. Uh, Tony recently was on the commentary team for the NBC Olympic coverage of Tokyo 2020. Uh, and, Tony, and Tony has his own podcast, the Tony Azevedo podcast that is hosted by Dave Williamson. A great conversation. Uh, I've been a guest on that podcast and it's, it was super fun. Uh, and Tony has an incredible lifetime dedicated to water polo. So Tony, thanks for joining us, Janai and I today from Southern California, where it looks like you just got out of the water from the Academy is my guess. Yeah. <laughs> you know me well, Sean, right <laughs> out of the water, finished with the you know, 45 minutes of shooting. That's my favorite part to get in. Yeah. And now, uh, and now back to the business world a little bit. Fantastic. Let's talk about six, eight sports. Uh, it's you're, it's growing. I mean, you've been growing it quite a bit over the last four or five years. Uh, this podcast, we're trying to focus on sport growth and six, eight, trying to take a look at water polo in a, a little bit different direction. We've worked together on the series, six, eight series. We've worked together on challenge on game desk, Kind of just give us an overview of how you're trying to bring water polo into the modern era with technology and data. Well, yeah. I mean, look, the main thing to me is right now, and in, in, in a lot of other sports too, no one is focusing on that individual athlete, right? That one parent who has that one kid who's so passionate and wants to be great, but there's no, there's no means to tell them where they stand and what they need to do to be great. Right. And that's kind of the most frustrating part about sports like water polo that are smaller is like, dude, I see it all the time going around the country, kids with talent, kids that are fast, good. They have heart parents who, who are willing to do whatever it takes for them to get there. But yet there's no there's nothing that tells the kid exactly where they are here. Here's the drills that you need to do to be great. Right. Yeah, right. And so that's kind of been the focus. Another focus right now of us is really focusing on how we can money ball water polo. Right. And we've been yep. talking with. John Abdu and USA Water Polo, a little bit of, of partnering maybe. And, and the main idea behind it is like, can we take statistics and measurables, subjectable, and, and, and start to collect data over time so we have a better understanding as to where our teams are now, where they're going, where they're trending, and why they're successful. For me, you, you take the women's team and the men's team are an example, right? Right. Like, what, what, why did we succeed in 2008? What, why did, was, did Terry do something different than Rakko Rudich, than John Vargas, than Monty Laskowski? I mean, on the men's side, I went through eight different coaches, right? Nine different co coaches. What was successful? What was not? On the women's side, they have three gold medals. Yeah. All right after Guy Baker. Like, what are they doing? What, are they testing differently? What are the strengths of the weaknesses? Because we know very well, we have, we all know Cammie Craig, who be in the Hall of Fame coming up and, and she's a stud, but her era that there was that women's team was much different than the women's team that I saw in this last Olympics. So what was the change? How did he measure that? And if we could use that data to better understand where we need to go, I mean, especially for us on the men's side, it, it could be a game changer, but right now everything, and this goes to every single club and federation in the world, everything right. is dependent on the coach, right? And his words, well, how do we know what he thinks or believes is correct? And we don't, and then we get rid of them. And then got all that information that he gave us for four years or two years or one year at a club is gone. And then right. comes another guy and we're like, I hope, I hope you can save us. So Tony, you made a reference to Moneyball. I don't know if you know that I actually coached Billy Bean's daughter. So I can connect you guys if you want. You no go. way. I'd love to do that. hundred <laughs> yeah. percent. We're, we're, we're very close to like fully launching that. So I, I think that I'd love to have his perspective. Yeah. Yeah, and what his daughter guy. played polo at Sage Hill. Yes. Yeah. Oh, we're up. <laughs> well, how about that? That's crazy. One of my favorite movies and stories of all time. I, I mean, I love that, that concept and that idea. I mean, you, at this point, must have hundreds of thousands of lines of data just from this challenge alone being collected all over the world. How, what, are, what are some of the trends that you're seeing in the game? Like, what are, how, how would you interpret that data early on here 
uh, as, as you're collecting that information? So, yeah, so we, we just, we just hit 13,000, uh, people gone through the challenge, which is super exciting. And the exciting thing about that is like, you're able to see trends, people who've done it multiple times, people, you know, successful people. And now with the six, eight series, we got to see so many top level athletes, a trend that I think we, that hundred percent we found. And again, it, it always, it always varies a little bit. You're going to get a guy with an amazing radar gun or get a guy who can jump out of his, you know, suit, but mostly people successful at the 12.5 the med ball and the buoy are the most successful in all when it comes to like those three drills can you're pretty much on par the best player in the water is those three and then we're starting to measure because we're using the game desk so it's like how many steals does someone get well the guy who gets the most steals always seems to be the top in the buoy and the vertical jump right, right. yeah so you can start to see some correlations that go along with that interesting well, yeah, because uh, if you're if you're getting steals in a game, and, and we had a talk with the Orlando Magic uh, analyst yesterday, actually with Maggie, and one of the if you're getting a steal in a game, you have long arms or you're super tall, right? That's one reason. Um, you are quick. You can get quickly jump in front of the ball, you know, jump before or beat someone to a ball. And then the second thing is your water polo IQ. You have a high IQ. You can anticipate and you can read. And obviously, we can't read an IQ through the challenge but we can read it through the 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 game desk right so now we're kind of covering that that basis well and you've even talked about you know with maggie about that x factor how do how do we measure that x factor with an athlete in terms of being able to see those on the the undescribable traits of an athlete that just make them great right in terms of trying to do that for instance yeah for exactly 100 percent. and a brenda is a great example because the hard part when you do the challenge is like you're, you you sit there and, and I get it all the time. Mostly it's like the older generation. It's saying, oh, you know, that that doesn't measure the uh, the best athletes. You're right. It's not meant to measure the best athletes. It's meant to get data to show a over time if they're improving and b if they are the best athletes, what traits do they have? And then the second part of it, and this is where a Brenda would be perfect in this because she would be actually amazing in med ball. She'd be amazing in two buoy. She'd be pretty good at the 12.5. And then maybe like me, I'm the radar gun, you're low, vertical jump, probably, you know, obstacle right. be okay. But guess what? The game desk, she'd be so dominant that it totally make up for her falling right. maybe in not the top 10 or 15 because she'd have a plus or minus of 10 because she has four assists a game, four goals, three steals, <laughs> 10 earned, you know, six earned ejections. And that's Brenda to an epitome. Awesome. So, I mean, you had mentioned a little bit about this, but how, how do clubs and athletes that are outside of California get noticed? I mean, using this system, what's the best way for those kids who want to be great that are maybe not in um, uh, the, you know, in Southern California or Northern California proper, how, how do they progress in the game, in your opinion? Well, they, they have to understand the importance of, A, they have to really, coaches have to open their eyes as to where they stand in the world of water polo, where and what the better players have. So what I see a lot is I see the 13, 14, 15 year old kids and they're dominant in their hometowns, but they really don't understand how to move over their hips, the legs and breaststroke kick or the importance of the med ball, right? Of having strong legs, not just the med ball, but having strong legs in general of passing. And these three things, you get these players from all over and they're so talented and they work so hard, but they're lacking on just the basics of how to hold a ball, of how to pass correctly, of calming down. So I think that's really where the challenge was built. It's like, where do you stand? This is where you are. You're pretty good. You're not good. And this is things you can do to get better. The other thing is like you, you do, when you get to a point and then you're in high school, you have to expose yourself to different water pool. Like I, right. financially you can do, I was lucky enough. We didn't have money growing up, but I went with my dad on trips as like, you know, kind of like the, whatever it was basically, he always paid for me and I'd sleep with him in the hotels. So I got to see the exposure from playing against a Hungary or playing against a Serbia at a young age, or it was Yugoslavia then. But if you can't make it to a Europe, make it 
make it to California or get outside of your state and see the different types of water polo. Go to a camp somewhere else, right? Janai runs camps, myself. Like there's plenty of opportunities to, to expose yourself to different water polo because that's gonna help you A, understand truly where you stand and B, become more, have a higher water polo IQ because you're listening and hearing so many different thought processes, right? Right. Well, and I think, I mean, one that's obvious uh, is that we're coming into the second season of the 6-8 series across the country. I mean, we've got, uh, I believe, Connecticut, Texas, Utah, California named as locations that are going to go. I mean, those are fantastic ways. How would an athlete get involved in one of those to be able to be recognized and see some of that high-level play? So, Sean, it's, you know, it's, I think what's been exciting about us doing it together is we're trying, we've always been trying to solve the issue of how do you get quality games to athletes outside of, of, you know, Southern California or Northern California, wherever the top heads are. And, and this is kind of, we've seen kind of how this has evolved, right? We had Jack Merrill sign with Stanford, who wasn't really on that radar before the 6-8 series. We had Greg Carson go to UCLA. We've had so many players sign with top schools because they were good. And then they, all of a sudden, when they understood where they stood, you know, their level, they got to play against that high level competition, they stood out. And maybe before they, they didn't, right? Right. So yeah, I mean, for us, it's emailing us and getting on the list. And, and we just try and make it as, as it, we're pushing the, the ones that are trying to get to college first, right? Obviously, right. get them exposed. But, but we also always allow in young players, because I think that's also building the whole evolution. If we can have freshmen, sophomore with some of these great players, you're going to already see, you've talked about the, the great Ben Four who had that awesome tournament, you know, and, had, and he was great in the series. He's a little freshman. Well, now yeah. he's a sophomore right. and now other kids are going to look up to him and, and whatnot, right? Yeah. Well, and it's so fun to watch those kids. Even like we went to, I went to every one of those series last year and we obviously live streamed them, but those kids got so much better from one camp to the next. I mean, it's fantastic. I've seen even my own kids from Olympus who have participated. They've gone on to see some great things happening as well. So it's, it's exciting to see. In, in explain to me this, and Janai, you're perfect to answer this. Like I had a coach tell me that the six, eight, the problem with the six, eight series, right. And, and again, we've had the, all the top schools, the top eight, all of them responded that they love our videos and they're watching. But I had, a, I had a coach say, you know, I'd like to see these players play in a system. And I said, why? That you, you can, they're all in high school. You can go watch them in a system. A system's easy to play. Hey, you swim here, you do that. I want to see them. And this is the best thing that we saw on the series is the first two games were terrible. <laughs> Always, yeah. <laughs> they don't know. Yeah, you see that even, even with even with like national teams at uh, different age groups, right? Whether it's youth or cadet, when there's new people playing together and getting to being accustomed to playing with new players in different positions, it takes time to work out the kinks. Hundred percent, and and that and that's the whole point. Is like by the third, fourth, the last game almost always went in. There was a game that went in on the last day to overtime. It's because they learn to communicate with each other. Hey, our team doesn't have a strong center. I'm gonna post up. They learn how to play. And then you talk, you want to shine at college when you show up. You want to shine on the national team when you show up. Well, guess what, bud? You got to learn how to play in any kind of system. You got to learn how to adapt, how to talk to your teammates, be a leader, right? Take over roles. And that's that's where I see a big value in this. Yeah. So just quick question. Tony, what level was this coach coming from? Was it a collegiate coach? Was it a high Division, school coach? Division one collegiate coach. So that, again, that's that's their preference, right? They might have their own recruiting preferences, um, and it's not for everybody. But if you can, you're never going to have a one size fits all, especially in a sport like ours. Sure. But my thing is the number one thing I think that hasn't made this work in the past is there's just not enough data, right? It's not baseball, it's not basketball. Ba- um, Bailey is the first person who came up with this idea, pitched it to me over 10 years ago. He's like, Janai, you're with Nike, make a Nike water pole combine. It's like, Bales, you know, it would have to be replicated the same way throughout the entire country to make it standardized. And it was way too overwhelming for me. Then comes along Tony and you took on that challenge, right? <laughs> and so with that challenge, I think over time, you said 13,000 athletes have gone through the system. So the more athletes that go through it, the more 
data you're going to have and the easier it is going to be break down. I mean, James Graham has done it at UOP, you know, with this uh, one particular college team, but being able to standardize it for the nation is a task I would never want to take on myself. Um, so <laughs> hey. thank you for doing it. And it's starting to work out. And I think it's only going to get better. Yeah. How do, how do clubs get involved? How do, if a club wants to run the six, eight challenge, what's the best way for them to, to get connected with six, eight? Yeah, it, it, look, it, it's just reach out. So we have like PV 680, you know, we have our international. So this is trying, we're trying to standardize this around the world. And I, Australia is probably the biggest one right now that we're working with. Um, just reach out to us. And, and the way it works, we, we have a lot of ways it works. One of the ways I just. By us, he means Sarah Azevedo. That, yeah. That's right. My wife. <laughs> no, the email there and whatever it says, it's my wife, even if it says. <laughs> But yeah, just reach out. And, and essentially, all we're doing is giving you data, right? And hopefully, at the end of the year, you can start to see trends for coaches, for players. Hey, this entire team is improving in every category. Or hey, this one player is not improving. That's a player problem, right? If the whole team's not improving, then we can think about new drills for the coaches. And we're really just there to support. People think it's like, oh, you know, it's some financial burden. No, it's not. I usually just come to a camp, teach you how to be certified. Yeah. And then it's on you. And then all Maggie and I do is give you feedback as to like what these kind of red or yellow or whatever the results mean, you know? Yeah. I mean, we we've run it at Olympus for a couple of years and my kids are, we're wrapping up our fall high school season. My kids are already asking, when are we going to run the six, eight challenge again? They love it. It's just a part of the fiber of what we do. They, they want to see where their results are and how they've progressed. So we're excited about that. So, you know, who'd be there. amazing at it would be Janai and Janai, Janai <laughs> would be one of those, he'd be one of those. I know for a fact that he would do his goalie drills because they're specific goal. And then he'd go into the field and do all our drills and then probably beat all of us. He would win all of them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I, re I remember doing some Kaz and Tony. And I don't remember this, Tony. I when I had like a double bar in off of a demonstration. Like, you can't show me up on this. You have to let me, you have to let me do the shooting. <laughs> yes, you would throw out some ridiculous shots. Somehow it'd be like a pinch bar. And I'm like, Jesus, Janai, like, you're a holy guy, man. <laughs> it's the swimming. It's the swimming that gets me. Is having someone hang on you for 25 meters and then have to swim back on defense and transition. And then when it's your turn to shoot, have the same thing. But yeah, for the, these type of drills, this would have been my bread and butter. The vertical jump. Oh, I remember man. even when Racco's coach, he was telling me some stories about Tempeste doing some ridiculous things. So I would stay after practice and make sure I bet beat Tempeste's touches by two. <laughs> <laughs> remember the jugs? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The jugs. Brian Alexander, who we're going to actually have on the uh, show coming up soon, I guess he did 60 jugs and was super proud in an hour. <laughs> so that <laughs> night, that night, I did 61. <laughs> And then same thing with Bales. I, I got down to two jugs. So I was doing one in each hand. And as strong as Bales is, his wrists weren't strong enough to support it. But because all those damn fingertip push-ups, I had oh. strong wrists. Don't you tell Bales that. He'll he'll deny that till he dies. But oh. yeah, so we're referring to Bales, Ryan Bailey, four-time Olympian, also silver medalist. He's one of our good friends. And, and it is true that he was the first to come up with the idea of the challenge. Like he was, we joke around about it. But he was 100% the first, kept telling all of us. And then as I traveled around the world, it was one of those like, wow, I think this could actually work, you know? So that's actually a perfect lead into one of, I guess, the question that we're going to close on here, just by, for interest of time. I mean, you look back at that silver medal effort in 2008, you have guys like Adam Wright, Merrill Moses, Ryan Bailey, yourself. What made that group special? Like what made that, I mean, obviously you're great water polo players, you go on, but you have remained tight and enjoy each other's company ever since so i mean what what has made that group so special for water polo in america well i'm gonna i'm gonna say three things that that massively contributed to our success and the first was was the time when 2000 to 2004 the racco rudich my dad was the assistant then that time brought us together more than anything i mean janai was a part of that quad the, the things that we had to go through, the trainings that we had to endure gave us so much self-confidence, right? Like we could do anything. I mean, right, right. He, he even said, Racco, greatest coach in the world, that, 
that he experimented with us, that he couldn't believe that we could continue swimming for this amount of time. And, and when you have that commitment, Racco, you can say tons, any, everyone has opinions on Racco, but one thing he did so well was bring together the team. And with us, it was about A, the personnel, guys who really help the team. Janai is a great team player, Adam Wright, myself. I mean, guys that just really are there that bring and uplift the team because that's so crucial. Right. And of course, the fact that we're going, we're training so much, we all kind of hated him. So we <laughs> banded together as a crew. And I right. think that that in itself was huge. Then you go on to that terrible two and a half years where we had Guy Baker as a coach. Then they fired him. We had my dad as a coach. Then they fired him. And it kind of left us as, in this moment, like, we, I don't know if people know this, but qualifying for the Pan American Games in 2000, for the 2008 Olympics, like, the coach, because Terry Schroeder was who was the assistant, had a job. The coach was Adam and I and Bales. And it was right, like, right. And so we took ownership in this team. It was like, whatever happens, we it, like it's on us now, guys. Like we can't not train all out. We can't not, um, you know, believe in ourselves and be humble. Like if we lose. It's all it's on us. And then I think that last that last tipping board was the fact that so many of us were overseas, right? Yeah. And we came back, we got that experience, that, that confidence. Now we can play against the Europeans. We had that from Racco. And then Terry really, Terry and Robert Lynn did a phenomenal job of Robert got us in the greatest shape of our lives. And he knew he could do whatever he wanted with us because we took ownership and Terry did a great job for me as a captain, for all the athletes, just to understand of humility and playing together and sometimes less is more. And, and we won that, you know, and I, and, and hey, go ahead. Tony, go, going back to that qualification game though, in Brazil against Brazil, do you remember what happened to that morning? Yeah. When we thought we got kidnapped. <laughs> We're in the, in Brazil. No. Okay. Explain. Hold on. Were you not on the bus with us? Oh my God. Yes. I was on the bus. Yes. Yeah. Was, well, that was so <laughs> You've played so many games, so many Pan Am, so many Olympics, <laughs> that you almost forgot about being kidnapped in Brazil and taken to the favelas, all to be rescued by the the SWAT team, <laughs> and finding out that we actually weren't kidnapped, that the guy was just lost. You don't remember that? <laughs> no, I don't. I, I totally remember that. And it's crazy because you guys asked me, and I hadn't really lived in Brazil. I only knew really. I, I ended up living four years in Brazil. That was my the last contract I had. But you guys were like, Tony, this doesn't seem right. I'm like, this definitely doesn't seem right. I texted somebody <laughs> in like Portuguese and then they wrote back and they're like, dude, what is happening? And then all of us are freaking out. You, I, you, you were like going to go get the bus. <laughs> no, so, so basically they, we got morning training, right? And we're going to go back to the village, eat something, take a rest and go back to the gold medal game to qualify for the Olympics. And instead of going back to the village, the bus drivers drove us literally in the opposite direction. And I was like, I can't see the statue anymore. It's been two <laughs> hours. Where are we? Well, must have been traffic, must have been detour. And then all of a sudden, these black SUVs flank the bus and run us off the road and start screaming and yelling. Jesse tries to get out the front of the bus. Oh, my gosh. And so they point guns at him. They grab the bus driver, throw him in the dirt. I try to get out a back window. And I've got some of the biggest artillery guns facing point in my face. It's like, oh, they're going to blow us up. This is, we're just done. They get the bus driver back on the bus with a gun to his head, started screaming in Portuguese. I don't know if you understood what they were saying, but I didn't speak no. Portuguese. And they take us off the freeway into the favelas, and there's no place to turn around because it's too narrow. So it gets deeper and deeper. It's like, oh, they're just hijacking all of us. It turns out that that was the rescue squad that, that came to rescue an American team that got, they thought was hijacked by the bus driver who had actually just gotten lost. Like two and a half hours later. Now we get back on the freeway. There's a helicopter giving us an <laughs> escort. We get back to the village and it turns out that it was all mixed up. Supposedly, even though we were playing Brazil in Brazil and we didn't get a time to eat meal or take a nap, but we still came back and won the game. Yeah. And that, that, that happens more than you think, dude. Remember in, in Rome, 
I was woken up at two in the morning the day before we played Italy, taken to the police station. I forgot that. My take memory is just as bad as yours. <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah, I do remember that. Taken the police station. I sat there. They claimed there was something wrong with my 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 visa that visa. I was like a criminal bullshit. Next thing I know, about three hours before our game, I'm released to go back home. I hadn't eaten. I've been up since two in the morning. You know, Terry and Barbara was up. Barbara Calvis, the great, was over there trying to help out. <laughs> Next thing I know, everything was dropped. I show up. I eat. I go to the I go to the game. And don't worry about it. I scored six goals and we beat Italy <laughs> in the first game. In Italy, in Rome, yeah. In <laughs> Italy. <laughs> well, we we have we have a when g- games start going the wrong way, we have a saying like, you know, when the USA plays Hungary in Hungary, you have to beat everyone, not just the teams, right? Or uh, or Italy in Italy in in Rome. I guess you have the same thing happening. So when in Rome, that's hilarious. <laughs> that, exactly. <laughs> that's right. Well, dude, thank you guys for having me, man. Thank you, Tony. Appreciate it. And like I said in the intro, Tony and crew has some stories to tell. So one of my goals here, Tony, is to get you and your uh, and get Adam and Merrill all and Ryan <clears throat> Bailey and your teammate all on the same podcast and talk about teammates, the power of teammates. I think that would be incredible for the people to see those interactions. But I know you've got to go. Thanks for joining us. One last thing. I know you have the newspaper and coffee is your pregame routine, but do you have a, your favorite hype song of all time that you used to listen to? Ooh, so I was opposite. See, everyone would sit there listen to hype. I, Merrill would, I think he's should you know, he would have. He should be deaf. He should be deaf. <laughs> the, the music was so loud that the whole bus could hear. But I would, uh, I would actually just listen to either like something soft, um, or no music. I just okay. focused on reading, and that was it. I, I was so crazy when it came into the water. I just needed to calm down, and music got me too pumped. Cool, very cool, Tony. Right. Thanks so much. Good to see you. All right. Bye-bye. See you. Game on. See you guys. Game on. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.